There is a corner of Antarctica so remote, it is less well mapped than the moon. It is known as Queen Maudland. There you will find the Fenristuga Mountains, literally translated, Jaws of the Fenrist Wolf, a creature in Norse mythology so fierce that it devoured the world, putting it into endless winter. This is the story of one expedition's attempt to climb those mountains and their journey to the bottom of the earth. The notion to explore in the human spirit is a fairly interesting phenomenon. And what we were doing in Queen Maudland was really quite unique. It was a specialized kind of rock climbing called big wall climbing. Big walls are essentially huge rock climbs, bigger than you can do in a day. Just reaching Queen Maudland is a massive undertaking. It takes the team two weeks to find a pilot willing to fly into Antarctica's unpredictable and storm-laden skies. After a successful flight, they land on a glacial runway that is nothing more than a flat, wind-polished patch on the continent's mile-thick ice beds. From there, they set out on snowmobiles for the Fenristuga Mountains. But the sleds soon break under the weight of the gear. And there's another, more ominous omen. A mummified seal, frozen in time 150 miles inland from the nearest water. What would spur this coastal creature into such a misguided journey can never be known. The team decides to return to the airstrip, where a small twin-engine plane shuttles them to the base of the mountains. And this aspect is just beyond words. basically booted everything out the door of the Twin Otter and set up camp right there. We be home. He did one low flyby, did a wing wave, and we gave him a thumbs up, and he was gone in just a moment. It was very alone, very quiet. The most incredibly still place I've been. Temperatures in Antarctica can reach as low as 100 degrees below zero the wind can blow up to 150 miles per hour. Planning has to be meticulous. Man really doesn't belong in Queen Maud land. Man really doesn't belong in Antarctica. We're pathetically non-indigenous species there. And really the only thing that allows us to be there at all is the equipment that we bring down there and the support from the outside world. Days are spent in painstaking preparation until it is time to face the challenge that has brought them here. We come too far to do easy routes, so we were really keen to do something, something bold and dramatic. This is Rocket Niven, the Razor, an ominously sheer blade of granite. The North Face and National Geographic Explorer assembled Conrad Anker, John Krakauer, Gordon Wiltsey, and world-renowned mountain climber, Alex Lowe. This is another rough above the A-frame. Right above the A-frame? It's kind of a, an overlap. Yeah, the A-frame. It's 2,200 feet high from the snow to the summit. It's got a beautiful line from a climber's point of view. It starts in a lovely, graceful left-facing corner that's very direct. And that sort of peters out, and it's a bit of a blankish section that moves left again into another gray dihedral that goes directly to the summit. It's a climber's dream line. Where are we? Remind me where we are again. For Conrad and I, it was just, um, it was awesome. We couldn't believe how good the rock quality was, and it was just something special about sort of standing at the bottom of so much towering granite, and you can just sort of put your hand against it and almost feel a, a lifelike hum in these pieces of rock. We spent uh, the first five days fixing ropes. We'd climb to a new high point and then permanently anchor ropes there and then keep climbing, anchoring more ropes behind us. What that allowed us to do was descend every evening 
back to our base camp. You sort of spend these hours focusing on getting little pieces of equipment to stick into the cracks. Then you remember where you were, you look over your shoulder, and this was not just your ordinary rock climb in another standard area. This was a rock climb at the bottom of the world. Conditions have been ideal so far. Inevitably, however, the continent makes good on its constant threat of bad weather. We all knew from experience in Antarctica that somewhere out there, there was a storm in our future. And we were all kind of wondering when this was gonna happen. And of course, sure enough, it finally does get stormy. But the timing was absolutely perfect because it was Christmas Eve and we were ready to head down to base camp anyway. The team spends the holidays holed up at base camp, thousands of miles from their families, sharing stories and organizing gear. When they finally emerge, they are ready to begin living on the wall. At this point, it was no longer efficient to keep reascending these fixed lines. It took too much of our time each day. So it was time to move up and live on the wall, essentially go camping on a vertical sweep of granite. What we had to do first, though, of course, was haul up tons and tons of camping gear. We had probably 2,000 pounds of equipment. We had eight huge haul bags full of gear. Four of these alone are just full of ice. We were on a vertical desert of granite. There's no water source, and so we had to haul this ice with us so that we would have a resource for melting drinking water. There's only one way to make these bags that weigh 200 pounds a piece move, and that's to swear liberally and just pull hard on the ropes. On the wall, the team lives in portal edges, four foot by six foot hanging shelters that have to serve as home for two men. Lying in the portal ledge is a wonderful time to just reflect on the simplistic landscape, this beautiful juxtaposition of this dramatically horizontal with this dramatically vertical. The sun never sets in the Antarctic summer, and the sleep work cycle of the team becomes a dance of shadow and light. As soon as the sun goes behind the tower and you're in the shade, the temperature plummets 30 degrees and it's definitely time to get in your down bag. You've got 12 hours to watch the shadow of the tower do its beautiful arc across the emptiness. Just reflect on this incredible landscape. Life gets actually pretty darn simple on the wall. After nearly a week of living on the vertical, the team is within striking distance of the summit. We were starting to get close to the top. We knew that this thing did have a summit. We were ready to stand on top of it. It was super steep to the bitter end. It never let up. One minute you've got 2,000 feet of air between your legs, and the next minute you're just standing upright for the first time in 10 days on the summit of this thing, on this true island in the sky. Incredible experience. The summit is theirs. But the glory of the moment is soon put into perspective. If you have any notions of heroic deeds, they were all put to rest when we discovered these little petrol tracks. Here were these unassuming, humble little birds up there in this place that we'd struggled so hard to get to. Ten years of planning and ten days of climbing culminate in a first ascent the 2,200 granite feet of the Razor. One of the things that most often comes back in my memory of this trip is the stillness of Antarctica. And I think that stillness is really important to the human race. I think that we've created a frantic world for ourselves. And for me, it's just cathartic. There's a solace to be found in knowing that places like Antarctica exist. There's nothing but a sort of timeless hissing of snow being blown over the surface of this vast, empty land. And I think that's good for the human spirit. Thank you.